All right, everyone. So here we have special theory of relativity. Up to this point, we have been looking at classical physics. That means all the concept, including Newtonian mechanics, basically uh, that gave us laws of motion, um, waves, thermodynamics, um, electricity and magnetism, those are all considered to be a classical physics. And everything more or less was developed by end of the 19th century. That means you have, you can, you can go back uh, to the Galileo's time. So basically 17, 18 and 19th centuries. That's where all of those concepts basically developed. At the end of 19th century, uh, Maxwell gave us laws of electrodynamics. That means we have this Maxwell's equations. And one of the important things that came out of that was that light is an electromagnetic wave. Now, light being electromagnetic wave means that we now know what the light is and we know how fast it's moving. And when we start, you know, let's say the scientists, when they started doing experiments and they started doing, you know, theoretical investigation of light as an electromagnetic wave, they realized that classical physics breaks down, especially when you look at when objects moving very fast, where the speed is compatible to the speed of light in vacuum, or when we look at objects that are very small, uh, like subatomic particles, electrons and protons and things like that, classical physics breaks down. It cannot predict the outcomes. That's what I mean by breakdown. That means the result and the predictions don't match. Well, that's why in 20th century, we have um, sort of like a revolution in physics where some of those classical ideas had to be left behind and we had to then develop some new ideas, new branches of physics to try to explain things that now we are um, experimenting. So the results of the uh, light um, can only be explained now with uh, the specialty of relativity or uh, quantum physics. That means when we talk about the physics of very fast, then we have to look at specialty of relativity. When we have to look at physics of very small, then we have to look at quantum physics. And obviously one of the things about this modern physics, right, the relativity and uh, quantum physics is that they're bizarre. They're very weird. And there's some incredibly, you know, counterintuitive, you know, consequences. So for example, here, we're going to study the, you know, special theory of relativity in this chapter. And we're going to see some of the, you know, really uh, incredible effects of the objects moving fast. Here, let's say we start with this image over here. This is from a science fiction book that was written in 1940. It's called Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. And it was written by a physicist, George Gamow. Now, what we do in this image is, or in this book, right, is we assume that speed of light is only 10 meters per second. So here, Mr. Tompkins basically reads a book on relativity where he realizes that when you are moving relative to other objects, right? When basically you're moving fast, then um, things change, right? So basically what one of the things we're gonna see here is there are some consequences of object moving fast, closer to the speed of light. So let's say right now in this book, we assume that the speed of light is 10 meter per second. So if you move at 10 meter per second, which is roughly 20 miles an hour, then we can feel that relativi relativistic effects. So, and Mr. Tompkins, has been worried about the you know change in his figure. So he was happy that if he starts moving fast, then he can see himself getting thin. Well, he's, when he started you know, riding a bicycle, close to the speed of light, or you know, let's say 10 meters per second. By the way, nothing can move as fast as speed of light, but you can get very close. So, but let's say he's moving at compatible to the speed of light speed. I remember in this book, it's about 10 meters per second or 20 miles an hour, hoping that he will change. He will see you know, ch uh, changes in himself. 
But what he realized is, you know, exactly the opposite. There's absolutely nothing changed about him. So he was just, you know, just like before he was, he started moving at 10 meter per second. What he noticed though, is that everything around him changes. Okay, everything around him changed. So you have the streets getting shorter, the windows becoming very thin, like a thin slits, and the policeman basically becoming very thin man. So he then realized that what we mean by theory of relativity is that things change relative to you if you're moving very fast. By the very fast, we mean in a way that speed compatible to the speed of light. That means what you see here is you see your environment changing. Or if you're an observer, right? That means, you know, for the observer, observer absorbs like, let's say, changes in the environment. All right, so those are the things we're gonna be studying in this chapter. That means when objects moving very fast, we will see changes in length of the environment or, you know, some kind of measurement or changes in the time of measurement, but it all has to be relative. You know, doesn't matter how fast you're moving, your clock will not be any different than if you're just sitting in your room and not moving. Okay. The idea here is that it will be a change when you compare yours, let's say your clock relative to something else that's moving differently, you know, uh, or different speed, different direction relative to you. All right, so that's sort of like, let's say the concept that we're gonna be studying in this chapter. Okay. Now let's go back, look at the Newtonian mechanics. We can see, right, the Newtonian mechanics fails to describe properly the motion of object to speed approach that of light. That means for everyday applications, Newtonian mechanics works perfectly fine. You wanna build bridges, cars, airplanes, space shuttles and things like that, right? Perfectly fine. Newtonian mechanics can give you exactly correct calculation and you know you don't have to worry about anything else. But if you try to, you know, look at, we're not there, but let's say when we get into the, um, let's say uh, time where we can build spaceship that can travel from one solar system to another solar system, Newtonian mechanics can actually break down because then we have to move really fast. We have to build something that can move fast enough. And then this concept requires special theory of relativity or general relativity. And that's what we're gonna see here. Some of the calculations, some of the equations that we had used before have to be modified. Sort of like, let's say the relativistic effect has to be applied to them. So that means Newtonian mechanics, you can see that is a limited theory. It places no upper limit on speed. That means according to Newtonian mechanics, you know, you can move faster than speed of light in vacuum. Well, and that obviously have not been absorbed. So experiments don't, um, don't agree with this theory. The experiments show that there is a limit to the speed and the speed is three times 10 to eight meter per second. And the only, only thing can move at that speed is the speed of light. Basically is the light. Only light can move at that speed, only in vacuum. You know, light actually, remember, slows down when it goes into uh, more dense mediums. Uh, but in vacuum, it moves at the speed of light, C. But that's the fastest it can move. Nothing else can move at that speed and nothing else can move faster than that. Okay, so that's already a contradiction there. Um, so then what we're going to do here is Albert Einstein basically came up with this special theory of relativity. So one of the things we're going to see this, this term relative, right? The relativity is not really unique to Albert Einstein. So this is not necessarily, you know, at least, you know, this term relative. We have used it even before when we talk about relative velocity, relative motion, right? So um, one thing we'll see that there is a classical relativity theory, right? So the, of the theory of relative motion. And then we're going to see that there is a more modern one where we do have to apply this relativistic effect. Okay. So that means one thing we can see here is when you then talk about the more complete theory is Einstein theory is more complete because it takes into account slower speeds and faster speeds. That means you can say that Newtonian mechanics 
is a special case of the Einstein's theory of relativity, special theory of relativity, because Newtonian mechanics is part of the Einstein special theory of relativity when objects moving slow, but then it cannot describe a fast moving object, special theory of relativity can do both. So that's why it's a special case of that uh, Einstein special theory of relativity. Einstein gave us two relativity theories. One is a special theory that deals with speed, uh, the, you know, object moving very fast, like the speed, of, you know, co compatible to the speed of light. He also gave us general relativity, which is completely different concept. It's a concept uh, that actually replaces gravity theory. So uh, I, I highly recommend you guys check it out in terms of what is general theory of relativity. And that's basically another way of describing gravity. Okay, so which is incredibly uh, insightful, like really probably one of the most brilliant ideas uh, in the entire human uh, existence. So that concept of uh, general general relativity, right? Down that, that Einstein came up with to describe, you know, gravity. All right, so here's then what we have uh, to describe a physical event. A frame of reference must be established. That means one one of the things we're going to do here, we're going to then sort of like let's say develop the or look at classical theory of relativity and show that how it can break down when we apply fast moving objects. And then we then modify that uh, with, uh, let's say, relativistic factors to then be able to describe, uh, let's say, any type of object that is moving fast. All right, so one thing we have here is to, to start with developing those theories, we're gonna talk about um, frame of reference because whenever you're doing some kind of experiment, uh, you wanna have and this is also something that we, uh, we always do uh, in the beginning of studying physics. So every time we start concept of uh, force, so if you can go back and review it yourself. Uh, so when we talk about Newtonian laws of motion, we always talk about reference frame. And we always talk about inertial reference frame. So there are two types of reference frames. Reference frame where laws of Newtonian physics or obeyed, we call that inertial reference frame. That means that's when we studied Newtonian mechanics. Studying Newtonian mechanics, we always established some kind of reference frame. And we said that if you have a reference frame that obeys Newtonian laws, then that reference frame is an inertial reference frame. There you go. Which is, um, for example, right? So that means you do an experiment over there and it agrees with the prediction. Okay, for example, you have a very simple experiment. So you're standing here, you put a, a let's say a ball, soccer ball next to you. And if nobody's kicking, um, kicking the soccer ball, it will just stay there because Newton's first law tells you that object is at rest, will remain at rest until some external force acts on it. Okay, but if no force acting on it, nobody's pushing or pulling or kicking, it will just stay there at rest. Okay, now, one thing we have here is the same experiment can be done if let's say you're in a bus, let's say you're in a bus, so you can put that ball next to you in a bus if the bus moving at constant velocity. That means if the bus moving at constant velocity, you can still do that, right? So that's why, for example, the, the airplane, right? When airplane is on autopilot, basically moving at constant velocity, you can just put a hot cup of coffee in front of you and then just enjoy the coffee and without not worrying about, let's say, spilling it on yourself and things like that. That means you can treat this as just like you're sitting in your room, but only when the airplane is moving at constant velocity, right? So one thing we can then say is that in order for the frame, the reference frame um, to be inertial reference frame, that means it has to obey the laws of mechanics. Okay, so that, that's what I want, right? So the inertial frame is one which an object is measured to have no acceleration if no force acts on it. Any frame moving with constant velocity with respect to an inertial frame but also be an inertial frame. That means I can take this to be inertial frame. So let's say you're outside just sitting there. I can say, that, okay, so that's, a, you know, or standing there with the ball next to you, that's an inertial reference frame. But then someone else moving in, you know, uh, in, in a moving bus, 
repeats the same experiment and gets the same result, then we can say it's an inertial reference frame as well. Well, in order for it to be inertial reference frame, it has to be moving at constant velocity relative to you. So the inertial reference frame is the reference frame that is not accelerating. Any accelerating reference frame is not an inertial reference frame. So the laws predicting the results of an experiment performed in a vehicle moving with the uniform velocity will be identical for the driver of the vehicle and the hitchhiker on the side of the road. That means as long as two observers have velocity, even if there's different velocity, but they're moving at constant velocity relative to one another, they then can say that um, Newton laws of motion will be obeyed so their measurements will agree, like we're gonna see in the next few slides. So let's look at what we call the principle of Galilean relativity. Uh, as you can see, right, this principle is um, pretty much uh, is the time of Galileo, Isaac Newton, uh, and it has been around for a long time, so this concept of relativity. So the principle of relativity states that the laws of mechanics must be the same in all inertial frames of reference. Right? That means laws of mechanics is the same, and that's the key, right? So we're gonna see that later on, this laws of mechanics means that Isaac Newton's laws of motion um, will be the same in all inertial reference frames. So here's a couple of ways we can look at it. So you have um, an observer in the moving track. Okay. If, you, if, you, if you're an observer in a moving track, for example, this guy over here, what he will do, he, you know, let's say he throws the ball up. So the ball gonna be moving straight up, will go reach some height and come back down. Again, we're assuming that the track is moving at constant velocity. Okay. If the track is moving at constant velocity, if you do this experiment, what you will see here is no different than if you would have done that in your, uh, let's say physics lab. So if you throw the object up, it will go straight up and straight down, okay. So this is just pretty much a, you know, a one dimensional free fall, right? So we studied this in uh, the, the chapter two. Um, so it's just one dimensional free fall. If you have a observer that's gonna be looking at the same experiment that is done by the guy in a moving truck, for example, here, she will see something different. The stationary observer then will see that path is not straight up or down, but it's a parabola. Okay, it's a parabola. Okay. So she will see this as a projectile, which is a two-dimensional free fall. Okay. But one of the things we did when we, were, when we studied one-dimensional free fall and a two-dimensional free fall was that if you're looking at the time of the object going up and down, straight up or straight down or projectile, it's gonna be exactly the same. So the only difference here is, here the object has only vertical velocity. Remember, so the vertical velocity is equal to zero at the top and then it's, it goes straight down. Here, if you look at just the vertical component of that, you can see that it has a vertical velocity. Here then vertical velocity is zero. Then here then vertical velocity will be something like that. V, v, uh, v final, right? So for the fi uh, vertical velocity final, which means that final velocity in a vertical direction and initial velocity and maximum height velocity will be exactly the same for both, uh, both experiments. Okay, so here when it com comes back down, we can measure to be exactly same final velocity. The only difference here is that the ball has a vertical a horizontal velocity component, Vx, which actually will be matching the, the track velocity. Okay, because when you do this experiment in the track, the track is moving, then the ball will always have the same horizontal velocity as the track. This is exactly the only difference between the experiment absorbed by the 
person in the truck and by the stationary observer. So one, one thing they will do then, they will both agree the motion obeys the laws of gravity and the Newton laws of motion. And both will agree how long the ball was in, air, in the air. That means if you measure the time going straight up or down or the projectile motion, the time is exactly the same. So if both of them agree on measurements of the time and let's say vertical position, right? Which let's say the motion of the, of the ball, then you can say that uh, those reference frames were inertial reference frames and the you know, Newtonian mechanic laws were obeyed. Even though the let's say the truck was moving at a different speed relative to the uh, observer, stationary observer. All right, so now that's basically the example of um, how we start in terms of like let's say looking at this the, the Galilean relativity. So now that we you know let's say um, we understand hopefully what inertial reference frames are, we understand that all the experiments that we do. Um, will agree on uh, pretty much same time and same, uh, let's say, uh, same type of motion, right? So that means that, you know, predictions that can be made will be uh, absorbed. So then we're going to then look at in terms of what we call an event. Okay. So then event is some physical phenomenon that can be basically absorbed by different observers. One can be at rest, the other one can be moving, you know, to the right, the other one can be maybe moving to the left, doesn't matter. But one thing we have here is, this is an event and it's a physical phenomenon and it has uh, coordinates that can be, you know, basically the spatial coordinates, X, Y, Z, and the time coordinate to represent the position and time. That means when something happens, you can only describe this event by not only pointing out where it happened, that means, you know, some kind of position and also when it happened. Okay. For example, your birth is an event. So uh, when you were born, there was a very specific location when you were born, like let's say hospital, right? X, Y, Z, but also a time. Because if you give me just the position, uh, position of the hospital where you were born, well, Probably there is a, there are children you know um, uh, based there you know children basically burning that uh, the the hospital for uh, every second right so I wouldn't know let's say which one is is yours um, if you give me the time I wouldn't know which hospital because you know different you know maybe at that time when you were born there are like you know hundreds of you know other kids were born in like let's say just maybe in the same hospital but you know you can imagine uh, other places as well. That means, but if you give me the location and time, then, you know, I can pretty much point out that specific event. So that's kind of what we have. That means event has X, Y, Z, and T combined together. It means we have to give spatial coordinates, X, Y, Z, you know, to give us three-dimensional coordinates and the time. That means all of, you know, for everything for in this chapter will be in terms of this. So if there's event, we always have to include all of those measurements. All right, so let's start with this. For example, you have um, use a coordinate system that I'm going to do. So we're going to call this x, y. Uh, we, we can just, you know, make it two-dimensional. So that means, you know, we can think of it x, y, z, but, you know, as, as a, as a you know, for the purpose of drawing, let me do that, you know, two-dimensional. So x and y. So we're going to use this. So I'm going to call this inertial reference frame S. Okay, so kind of like that. So this is the ref inertial reference frame S. And all the reference frames are going to be inertial. So even if, let's say, I don't mention this is an inertial reference frame, uh, you need to understand that all the reference frames I'm going to be dealing with in this, in this chapter are inertial reference frames. Okay. So let's say you are standing here. And let's say your friend is standing right next to you, 
Right? So that's your friend right next to you. Right? It's hard to do like let's say on top of one another. So let's imagine that's you know that's your friend. Okay. Now what I can say here is then I'm gonna have this reference frame S represent U, and then I can represent then reference frame S prime, which will then represent your friend. So let's say here's you know your friend's reference frame is gonna be like X prime and Y prime. Since you guys are right next to one another, then uh, O and O prime, which means that, you know, all the coordinates are exactly the same for both of you. So basically both of you are right next to one another. So the reference, you know, the origin is exactly the same, horizontal position is exactly the same and thing like that. All right, so I'm doing this because, for example, if there is some kind of um, event, for example, some kind of firecracker or something like that. So um, let's say here's a firecracker, right? So there's a firecracker and both of you see the firecracker. Then because you guys are right next to one another, both of you then will measure the positions of this firecracker. So let's say with respect to the origin, for example, right? Your reference position uh, to be X. So this will be your measurement and then this will be your friend's measurement, x prime. Okay. And since, you know, uh, what you have here is O is equals to O prime, that means, you know, your reference position origin is exactly the same, then you will also agree on the position of the, uh, let's say, the firecracker, horizontal position. Well, you will also agree on a vertical position of the, let's say this will be Y and Y prime, right? So both of you, will agree on that. And also the Z and equals Z prime. That means primed are the measurement done by your friend, non-primed are the measurement done by you. And so it's some kind of, you know, uh, if there's a, you know, this firecracker, right? Uh, then your measurement will be exactly same as your uh, friend's measurements. And even T is equals to T prime, you will agree when it happened because you are right next to one another and you will see that, you know, uh, let's say that event. That means all of those things will be the same. Now, one thing we have here is you both are at rest. Both of you are at rest next to one another. So there is no relative motion uh, between you. So everything is exactly gonna be the same, which is you know, something you would definitely uh, expect. What we're gonna do next, we're gonna assume that, let's say your friend starts walking. So let's, let's say your friend starts moving. So then what we're going to do here, we're going to look at it in terms of, all right, so this is then, this is you. Okay, this is you. That means you, we, 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 I expect that this is your reference frame, S, right? So with Y and X. But then let's say this is your friend that is now uh, moving relative to you. So your friend is moving relative to you. Well, your friend is moving with the velocity V, so then, but I have S prime as a reference frame representing your friend, okay? So that means I can say then your frame is in the reference frame S prime, which is again, is an inertial reference frame because your frame is moving at the constant velocity relative to you, okay? So this V always represents velocity of the, you know, so velocity of S prime reference frame, okay? That's the velocity of the S prime reference frame relative to the S reference frame. That means how fast your friend is moving relative to you. Now, what I have here is then, this is, you can see, right? This is then this a position of, you can say, you can say also like the origin, right? Between your origin and your friend's origin. Remember before it was your origin and your friend's origin were exactly the same. But now your friend is moving with some velocity V so then the origin, you know, the, the, the distance between origins change. So let me call this D here representing that, right? So it means now what you have here is that um, O prime is equals to basically um, some this distance D, right? So let's, let's say uh, O and O prime are not the same. It means O prime is moving with that distance D, but that distance D is not constant, right? As the frame is, friend is moving, that changes. So you can say like, sort of like, let's say O prime is equals to O plus D, but then this D here is variable. So I can just represent it as um, V times T. Remember distance equals, um, or thing like this. 
So speed is equal to distance over t, because as, you, as you're moving with some speed, right, then you, you're going to change the distance. So then I can rearrange this, where I can say d is equal to v times t. That means this v times t represents that changing time varying distance between you and uh, your friend ref reference frame. Okay. That means in a way that's the same. So I can just get rid of that. So vt again represents the distance that is changing between you and your friend as the friend is moving away. Okay. Now, the idea is that if that, if now there's another event, so here's that event, right? P is event. Then both of you again start making measurements. One thing you have here is if you're measuring, then the position, horizontal position of that event will be this, right? So this will be that far away. So let me put like same thing here. So this will be then the position of that event measured by you in your reference frame S. Okay. But your friend is also measuring and he will measure this. He or she will measure that as a reference, you know, as the position of that event. Okay. Then X prime and X will no longer be the same because the S prime reference frame is moving relative to the S reference frame. So then you can see, right, the measurement, um, even though measurements are not the same, but in a way you can see, right, you guys more or less will agree exactly where the object is. So one thing we can do here is then we can uh, develop an equation that's, you know, so, sort of like relates those two, those two measurements. Okay, because one thing we have, we can see that, you know, X being measurement uh, done by you in your reference frame and X prime is the measurement done by your friend in his or her reference frame. And the difference between them is that X prime is equals to, or X is equal, this X, right? Or X is equals to X prime plus this distance V times T. Okay. That means X is equals to X prime plus VT. So this is how your measurements will agree, just like origin, right? Origin also, remember? O, you know, um, O is equals to an O prime plus VT. Okay, so O equals O prime plus VT. So then uh, what we have here is, this um, is called a transformation equation that allows you to relate those two measurements, your measurement with your friend's measurement. Okay, and what you have here is, Let's, uh, let's make a, a simple uh, an example with some numbers. Let's say your friend is moving at 10 meter per second. Let's say your friend is, well, it's, let's say it's moving at 10 meter per second. And then what they, what they do here is, let's say when the event happens, uh, your friend measures this X prime, the position to be, uh, let's say three meters from where he was. So that's the position of that event, three meters. So then what I can say here is if that event happened at T, you know, both of you agree that the event happens at three seconds, let's say, right? After your friend, let's say, started moving relative to you. Let's say your friend started moving and then three seconds later that event happened. So then your, measure, your friend measured three meters and then what you will measure basically will be three meters, your friend's measurement plus velocity which is how fast your friend is moving relative to you, which is 10 meter per second times the time, three seconds. So for you, that measurement will be basically, you know, 33 meters. That means position of that event is 33 meters relative to you. Because if your friend was moving at 10 meter per second for three seconds, that means you were, he was already 30 meters away from you. And then if you measured an event to be three meters away from him, that means relative to you, it's 33 meters. Okay. So that's kind of what we can do. We can always assume that at t equals zero is when you're, it, it's, it's right here, right? This is t equals zero. This is when your friend and you were right next to one another, at the rest relative to one another. And then at t equals zero, he started moving. So then three seconds later, let's say there was an event. Okay. Your friend was already 30 meters away from you when that event happened. So it measured to be three meters. And then that means relative to you, that event is 33 meters. Okay. So these equations are basically representing what we call the Galilean transformation of coordinates. 
That means you have X, Y, Z, T of the event relative to you in the reference frame S. X prime, Y prime, Z prime, T prime is the measurement relative to, the, to your friend in a inertial reference frame S prime. Then the relationship between the coordinates of you and your friend will be X is equals to X prime plus VT, Y equals Y prime, Z equals Z prime, and T equals T prime. Bit. That means you will always agree on time. That's one of the things about Newtonian mechanics. Time is absolute. That means all the observer will agree on time. That's one of the things that we have from the Galilean transfer, Gal, you know, Galilean um, relativity. You can also rearrange, right? So uh, just mathematically, just uh, rearrange and solve for the X prime. X prime then will be X minus VT. Y prime equals Y, Z prime equals Z. That means uh, you can, if I, for example, if I go back over here, see if I had given you this first, I said, like, let's say you measure that to be 30 meters, three seconds later after your friend was moving at 10 meter per second away from you, then you can say, all right, so X is equals to X prime plus VT, then rearrange, then X prime equals X minus VT, then X prime equals, so, uh, sorry, the, what I, what I meant, so this is, this, you know, what I meant here is that this X is 33, let's say, you measure the position of the event is 33. Then you can say it's 33 minus uh, then 10 meter per second, 33 meters, minus 10 meter per second times three seconds. Then you will measure to be X prime is three meters. That means you can just rearrange and solve for the position that your friend will measure. Okay. So that's kind of what we have. All right, so um, now one of the things we can also talk about here is, um, let's say, if I go back here, um, not that we know all that. So imagine what I have here is this. Maybe there is not an event over there like that, let's say, but maybe there is um, instead your friend, uh, let's say, I don't know, throws a ball. So let's say your friend throws a ball and here's the ball, and this ball is moving with some, what we call speed. Remember, V is used for the velocity of the S prime reference frame. So then velocity of any object, then we're gonna give it um, letter U. So this will be U, which is the velocity of the ball, but let's say this is measured by your friend, U prime. So let's say your friend throws a ball, and let's say this is 20 meters per second. So I'm using U prime because that's a measurement done by your friend. So your friend throws this ball at 20 meter per second. Then what will you measure to be the velocity of the ball? Is it gonna be 20 meters again? Well, let's find out. We can easily see this by looking at this equation, X is equals to X prime plus VT. Remember, you know that position of that let's say position of the ball, for example, the instant it's moving at 20 meter per second, you can then use this equation to calculate, right? But one thing we have here is we, if you talk about velocity, remember velocity is the rate at which the position is changing. That means what we do here is we take the derivative of this one. So dx dt equals then dx prime over dt prime. I remember t equals t prime, so it doesn't really matter. Then plus d, d, dt of this vt. That means derivative of each term with respect to time. We're going to take dx dt to be then the rate at which the position of that ball ch will change relative to u. So that's going to be ux, x representing horizontal component of that. dx prime dt prime is then ux prime, which is the velocity of the object relative to your friend in the s prime reference frame. Then plus, well, it's a derivative of vt, so then we'll just get v. Well, let's see then. Remember your friend was moving at 10 meter per second away from you. And then he throws a ball that is moving 20 meter per second relative while he was moving, he throws the ball at 20 meter per second. Then what you will measure is 20 meter per second that your friends measures plus 10 meter per second that your friend was already moving at that speed. Then what you will measure here is 30 meters per second. 
So that's what you will measure, 30 meter per second. If you're still confused about this, remember, if, if I go back to this uh, over here, right? Uh, to this experiment, remember, because the person in the truck is not moving rel this this could be considered as your S prime frame. This is as, as your S prime frame. See, when you do an experiment in the S prime frame, uh, what you have any experiment, if you throw the straight up, it means it's not going to have any type of horizontal component, right? It's just going to go straight up and down. But if you look in from, let's say, uh, you know, from the ground, right, as a stationary observer from the ground, what you see here is that the ball that goes straight up, but because the reference frame S prime moving with some kind of horizontal velocity, then you will see the ball also have a horizontal velocity. That means you will see that ball going projectile instead of just a straight up or down. So that's what we have. That means because your friend was, if your friend was stationary and throws the ball at 20 meter per second, you will also measure it 20 meter per second. But because your friend throws as it's as he or she was moving at 20 meter per, uh, 10 meter per second, that means the ball that you, you know, the ball that, you know, uh, let's say you will measure will has to be, you know, take into account that 10 meter per second. Okay, because relative to you, it's going to be then 30 meter per second. All right, so, and that's what we have over here. That means once we take the derivative of that, so then you can say ux equals ux prime plus v, ui equals ui prime, uz equals uz prime, or you can just rearrange and solve for the, uh, for the ux, uh, u prime measurements, right? That means, you know, if, if, if I give you your, if, you, if I give you the measurements of the ball relative to you, then your friend can then do the measurement, right? So for example, if here's, a, here's your reference frame and this is you, so if you throw the ball, then your friend in S prime, you know, let's say reference frame can measure that. For example, let's say your friend was moving at 10 meter per second, right, relative to you, and then you throw the ball at five meter per second. That means you throw the ball at five meter per second relative to you, that the ball is moving to the right at five meter per second. Now the question is, what will your friend measure? Well, all you have to do is just plug it into this equation. Then this will be, you know, a five meter per second minus the velocity at which your friend is moving away from you. And that's 10 meter per second. That means relative to you, u x prime is equal to then the negative five meter per second. Now the question is, does it make sense? Well, it should, because relative to your friend, when your friend is moving at 10 meter, meter per second relative to you, one thing you, your friend can say is that, you know what? I'm not moving. My friend, which is you, is moving back at negative 10 meter per second relative to me. Because we can say that, right? We can say that instead of having S prime moving to the right at 10 meter per second and S moving at being at rest, then we can say that, you know what? S prime, you know, reference frame is not moving and S, you know, uh, reference frame is moving backward at negative 10 meter per second. That's one thing we can do. All right, so that's why negative five meter per second is that instead of you moving backward at negative 10 meter per second, you're this, because the ball is moving toward your friend at five meter per second, your friend will only see the ball moving back at only five meter per second rather than 10 meter per second. All right, so think about it. Hopefully it will make sense. All right, so these are known as a Galilean velocity transformation. So it leads to serious contradiction when applied to object moving at high speeds, which we'll, you know, see in a little bit. But these are, you know, the just the transformation equations that we can have every time the object is moving relatively, uh, so like, let's say everyday speeds. Okay, so here's an example. So you have uh, two reference frame, reference frame S and reference frame S prime. Okay. So you have ball one and ball two about to collide and have their velocities shown in reference frame S. So what is the velocity U prime one initial of ball one in frame S prime? That means let's say here's your friend over there and your friend is gonna be then measuring the velocity of ball one relative to him or her in the reference frame S prime. Okay, so let's look at that. That means what I can, what we can say here is this, 
u one initial okay is equals to two meters per second then we can see that reference frame s prime is moving to the left at the speed of four meter per second so i can well this is a vector right? i can say that this is two meter per second i hat then v which is always the velocity of the frame is then negative four meter per second i hat all right then what I can say here is using that equation, ux is equals to ux prime plus vt, remember, right? So that's the equation. So then I can rearrange, I can say ux prime is equals to ux minus vt. Okay, so I can, oh, sorry, there is no vt over there, just v. Uh, VT is when you have a, you know, coordinate, position coordinate, like let's say calculation. Equation for the velocity doesn't have T. So uh, then, you know, this is basically my equation. So this will be equals to UX, which is two meters per second I hat, then minus, you know, V, and well, V is negative four meter per second I hat. Then what I will get here for UX prime as two meter per second I hat, plus this, you know, that's going to cancel out, right? You know, become positive. Four meter per second, I hat, because both of them I hat, I can add them together. Six, six meter per second, I hat. And that's basically the answer. That means the ball is moving to the right at two, two meter per second, but your friend is moving toward the ball at four meter per second. So relative to your friend, the ball will be moving at six meter per second because it's, it will be moving faster toward him because he's moving toward the ball. All right, so that's basically part A. Part B says, what is the velocity of U prime two initial of ball two in frame S prime? That means we pretty much do the same thing for the for ball two. Let's write it down. So this is the measurement of the ball two initial relative to U. Let's say remember, so let's say this is U. So this will be negative four meter per second I hat. Then, I have the velocity of the ball, sorry, velocity of the frame S prime, which is negative four meter per second I hat. Then equation ux prime is equals to ux minus v. So negative four meter per second I hat minus negative four meter per second I hat. That's basically the v, right? Um, well, what I end up with four meter per second I had plus, sorry, negative four meter per second I had plus four meter per second I had. Then I'm gonna get zero, All right? That means with respect to your friend, the ball two is actually not moving. Why? Because your friend is moving toward the ball. Imagine this, right? Imagine if uh, you throw a ball, but then you are able to, let's say, drive on your car as fast as the ball, so then what you will see, just the ball just sitting basically in air, but right next to you, not moving, just sort of like, seems like stationary, but it's not. Just both of you moving at the same speed. So the relative to you, then the ball is just at the rest because both have the same speed in the same direction. Okay, so that's what we have. All right, so now let's look at then Einstein's principle of relativity. So one of the things we have here is Einstein proposed a theory in which um, it resolves the contradiction between Galilean relativity and the fact that the speed of light is the same for all observers. So uh, basically we're gonna see that um, why there was a need to, um, to let's say, modify the, the Galilean relativity. Okay. So one of the things we have here is um, Albert Einstein obviously had uh, um, had already been exposed. That means like one of the advantages that he had was that he already knew of the fact that light is an electromagnetic wave. And Maxwell's equations show that light has a speed in vacuum as three times 10 to the eight meter per second. And all it was verified by the experiment already so the you know Hertz uh, did an experiment to demonstrate that um, the light 
indeed is an electromagnetic wave by discovering the radio waves. So one of the advantage of the Albert Einstein is that he knew about electricity, he knew about magnetism, he knew, he knew about the light being electromagnetic wave, thermodynamics and everything that, well, Isaac Newton didn't know about much, right? So at least, you know, in a way we're talking about like, let's say uh, ad, uh, advances in physics for, you know, over 200 years, almost 300 years, right? So then one of the things we, we did here, have here is this. So if I go back and very quickly remind you the principle of Galilean velocity, you know, the, the relativity, it was that um, all the, so the, the laws of mechanics must be the same in all inertial frames of reference. So the laws of mechanics must be the same in all inertial reference frame. One thing Albert Einstein changed is this, all laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames instead of laws of mechanics, which means it's not just mechanics, but electricity and magnetism and optics and thermodynamics, right? They all must be the same in all of the inertial reference frames. And which means like, let's say, not just mechanics, especially electrodynamics, right? Especially the fact that light is being electromagnetic wave should be the same for all in, in refer, inertial reference frames. Okay. Now, one thing we have from there is basically this. His other postulates is this, the constancy of speed of light, which means that the speed in all inertial frames, regardless of the velocity of the observer or the velocity of the source emitting the light, that means it's the same for all the observers. So again, speed of light in the vacuum has the same value in all inertial frames of reference, regardless. Again, regardless how they're moving relative to one another. Are they at rest? Are they moving far away from each other, moving toward each other? What we have here, the speed of light should be constant for all the measurements. So these two postulates basically are the basis of special relativity. Okay. Now let's see why do we need this, uh, like let's say changes to the Galilean principle of relativity. Again, the important thing here is to understand that the constancy of speed of light means that we will always measure the speed of light to be C, which is three times 10 to eight meter per second, regardless who's doing the measurement, where is the light, and how, how the reference frames are moving relative to one another. So let's look at uh, sort of like, let's say, measurement. <clears throat> so we have a reference frame S. So let's say here's, let's say again, let's say this is you in your re reference frame S. And let's say here's your friend S prime with uh, this is X, this is Y, then this is X prime, this is Y prime. Okay. Remember that reference frame S prime is moving with some velocity V. Now, one of the things we do here is this special theory of relativity, again, is specifically designed to understand the physics of very fast moving objects it's much more general than Newtonian mechanics because it can describe, you know, so like what happens at the low speed and what happens at high speeds. But obviously some of these effects is only visible, only noticeable when we're considering really high speed. So let's assume then, for example, this reference frame S prime is moving at 0.5 C, which is, half the speed of light. Let's say it's moving at 0.5 C. And let's say here's your friend with some kind of flashlight, some kind of, some kind of flashlight. Well, a flashlight, then you basically have a light from the flashlight, let's say going like this. And obviously the light from flashlight 
has a speed and your friend will measure the speed. And let's say if your friend measures the speed of light in his reference frame, that means u x prime, which is the speed of light in the reference frame s prime measured by your friend will be c. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. Let's say if you right now have a flashlight, turn on the flashlight and measure the speed of light coming out of this flashlight will be c. So that means u x prime equals c. But then because your friend's you know, frame of reference is moving at 0.5 c, what you will measure the speed of light to be according to the gal you know the galilean equations it will be ux equals ux prime plus v remember right which means that what your friends measures which is c plus what your friends frame of reference speed which is 0.5 c that means you will measure the speed of light to be 1.5 c that means according to you light is moving at 1.5 c but that's already a violation of the Einstein's principle of relativity because it says the speed of light in a vacuum has the same value in all inertial reference frames, regardless of the velocity of the observer or the velocity of the source emitting the light. Observer is in the frame S, source is in the frame S prime, and they're moving at different speeds relative to one another. But if you are measuring the light, Anybody, any observer should always measure that to be C. That means this cannot happen. You cannot measure the light to be at 1.5 C. Or for example, if this light actually moving uh, in this direction, right? So let's say your frame measures negative C, which is just to the left. That means your measurement then will be, you know, um, sorry, let's say C minus 0.5 C. So then you get 0.5 C. That means you will measure the light moving toward you at half a speed. Again, that's cannot happen according to the Einstein's principle of relativity. <clears throat> so that means you can see that if we try to use Galilean principle of you know relativity, uh, we're not getting the correct answer for the speed of light. We're getting higher than speed of light speed, higher than C or lower than C, but this is not, basically cannot happen, right? This is not the measurement that is actually experimentally observed. That means if we look at experiments, experiments show us that regardless who's measuring, the speed of light is C, All right? So that's why you can see, right? This is a sweeping generalization of the principle of Newtonian relativity, which refers only to the laws of mechanics. Okay, so now that we are understanding that laws of all physics should be obeyed, including the speed, you know, the speed of light, which is technically electromagnetic phenomenon, not mechanics. So um, we need then a modification to this, uh, the, the transformation equations. That means if we want to find how fast the speed of light is moving, uh, you know, we need to have an equation that basically gives us that. Okay. That means what we have here is there is no longer what we call an absolute motion and there's no longer gonna be an absolute time, okay? Because two observers should be measuring the speed of light to be C. And since if this is constant, that means the consequences of this is that the distance measurement between two observers at different, different rel, you know, uh, reference frames should be in disagreement. And the time measurement should also be then in disagreement because the simple, you know, C is equal to distance over time. That means in order for this C to always be constant, then D should be flexible and T should be flexible. That means they should not be constant. They should not be absolute. They should be then changing to accommodate for the speed of light to be constant always. That's why we're gonna be looking at two different types of consequences of the special relativity. One, one dealing with time, the other one dealing with length or the distance basically. All right, <clears throat> so you can see now we're gonna be looking at the consequences of relativity. So that starting with time measurements. So time measurement depends on the reference frame in which the measurement is made. Before it didn't, remember, 
Galilean principle of relativity states that t equals t prime regardless. Okay, that is absolute time. But here, consequence of this is that if you're measuring the time of an event in reference frame S prime, the reference frame S will measure a different time for the event or different, you know, a measurement of the, the time interval for something. Okay, that means events. Um, because right there's no longer an absolute time. So events at different locations that are observed, for example, to be simultaneous in one frame of reference will no longer be simultaneous in a different frame of reference. Okay. That means this is concept called simultaneity and simultaneity before was absolute. That means if something is simultaneous in one reference frame, would have been simultaneous in another reference frame, okay? This is no longer true. Consequence of, you know, special theory of relativity is if you see two firecrackers at the same time, then you can conclude those firecrackers happened at the same time. But if somebody is moving relative to you and looks at those two firecrackers, he will never see those firecrackers, you know, to be simultaneous because if I see them simultaneous, somebody else moving relative to me will never see that to be simultaneous. Okay. That means this special theory of relativity abandoned the assumption of simultaneity. Okay. So I would like to describe or, or show you this little clip, which um, kind of talks about that simultaneity, how in old classical relativity concept, you can assume that simultaneity is true for all the observers. But this little clip, you know, it, it's, again, it's kind of like old, but it very nicely demonstrates, you know, um, this new, you know, a simultaneity of, a relative to the special theory of relativity. Okay, so let's watch it. Imagine two observers, one seated in the center of Again. Imagine two observers, one seated in the center of a speeding train car, and another standing on the platform as the train races by. As the center of the car passes the observer on the platform, he sees two bolts of lightning strike the car, one on the front and one on the rear. The flashes of light from each strike reach him at the same time. So he concludes that the bolts were simultaneous, since he knows that the light from both strikes traveled the same distance to his eyes at the same speed, the speed of light. He also predicts that his friend up on the train will notice the front strike before the rear strike, because from his perspective on the platform, the train is moving to meet the flash at the front and moving away from the flash at the rear. But what does the passenger see? As her friend on the platform predicted, the passenger does notice the flash from the front before the flash from the rear, but her conclusion is very different. As Einstein showed, the speed of the flashes as measured in the reference frame of the train must also be the speed of light. So because each light pulse travels the same distance from each end of the train to the passenger, she can only conclude one thing. If she sees the front strike first, it actually happened first whose interpretation is correct. The observer on the platform who claims that the strikes happened simultaneously or the observer on the train who claims that the front strike happened before the rear strike. Einstein tells us that both are correct within their own frame of reference. This is a fundamental result of special relativity. From different reference frames, there can never be agreement on the simultaneity of events. All right, so that means two events that are simultaneous in one reference frame are in general not simultaneous in the second reference frame, moving relative to the first, okay. All right, so simultaneity is not an absolute concept, but rather one that depends on the state of motion of the observer. Okay. All right, so um, again, that means both of those uh, observers were correct, it just, the reference frames were moving differently, so they cannot agree on simultaneity. 
All right, so here's one more example here. So if Ann and Bill are standing 1,200 meter apart, a firecracker, which is an, you can think like it's an event, right? Explodes 900 meter from Ann and she sees the light flash at t equals five microseconds. So we're gonna look at in terms of at what time did the explosion occur? And we can assume that light, speed of light has a uh, speed as 300, you know, remember it's 300 million meter per second, or you can just say it's 300 meters per microsecond. That means during each, one, each microsecond, light travels 300 meters. Okay. So also our seeing the flash, sees flash and firecracker explodes the same event. And if not, which is more significant? And at what time does Bill see the flash? All right, so let's look at this example. Here. All right, since both Anne and Bill are at rest relative to one another, in a way, one thing we can do, we can assume that this is just one inertial reference frame where what position of Anne is then the origin, the reference position. Now, think like this, then what we have here is uh, when the firecracker happened, right, basically explodes, um, it travels in all directions, right? So that means, let's say, when we talk about, you know, uh, with respect to Anne, then as soon as the, you know, the firecracker explodes, it has to travel basically this distance to reach Anne. So let's say this is our, you know, delta X. So then delta X is the distance from the event to the position of Anne. And we can see, right, that's basically 900 meters. Okay. And speed of light, because, you know, uh, we're given in terms of mic meters per microsecond, can be then written as 300 meters per microsecond. Now, we know that general equation for the, that relates speed, time, and distance is speed equals distance over time. Then we can rearrange and we can say then time is equals to distance over speed. So this is 900 meters divided by then 300 meters per microsecond. So we cancel out, we should then get three microseconds. That means the time it takes for the light to reach N is three microseconds. All right, so it says, at what time did that explosion occur? Well, we are given that N sees the flashlight at T equals five microsecond. Well, it, but it only takes three microseconds for the light to travel that distance of 900 meters. That means the time um, of the firecracker is the difference between when it sees and minus how long it has to travel. That means five microseconds minus three microseconds. So then we get two microseconds. That means that, you know, the time for the, it means, you know, the, the time for the firecracker to explode, right? Where it exploded is two microseconds. It means the time of the event, right? T is equals to two microseconds. That's the time of the event. Okay. And what we have here is it says, are seeing the flash and the firecracker exploding the same event? Well, obviously it's not the same event, right? So firecracker exploded at T equals two microseconds and, and so the firecracker at five micros, at T equals five microseconds, which means they, you know, you have different, you know, uh, different time for those two events. So that means that they're not the same thing. Okay, seeing and actually happening are two different things. So what's more important here is the, the firecracker exploding, right? I mean, when the firecracker explodes, well, it doesn't matter if it's an, an, you know, Anne is there or not. Firecracker exploding means it's gonna explode, it's an event. So Anne being there is just basically, she can see that. Someone else can see that. Maybe the third or fourth person can see that. But I mean, the firecracker explodes regardless if there was anybody there to see it. Next, it says, at what time does Bill see the flash? Well, we can see that in terms of the distance between event, 
where the firecracker exploded. Uh, and Bill here is only 300 meters. Which means that it will take only one microsecond, right? For the light to travel this distance of 300. Since it's 300 meter per microsecond. Again, I can, we can do this, right? We can say, this is delta X1, this is delta X2. So then um, T, Tb for Bill, right, is equals to delta x2 over c. So then this 300, you know, meters divided by 300 meter per microsecond. So then you get my one microsecond. Okay, that means it will take only one microsecond for the light to travel to Bill. Now, one thing we already know is that the time of the event is two microseconds. That means when t was equal to two microseconds, the firecracker exploded. Then what time will the bill see the flash? Well, one microsecond after that, which means that for the bill, for bill, right, the ex, you know he will see the explosion at exactly t equals three microseconds. That means this is pretty much the time of the event, okay? But t equals three microsecond is when uh, when bill will see that. But again, in order for him to figure out when the you know explosion had occurred, he has to, you know, factor out, right? He has to take take that, you know, the time of travel out of the equation, right? In order to get that um, exactly the time of the explosion, which is basically one microsecond after he sees that. That means he sees this, uh, he sees the, the, the T equals three microsecond, uh, oops, three microsecond, that's when he sees the event. Where and saw that, you know, that event at five microseconds. All right, so those are basically um, just again, it's a simple example showing that uh, sometimes you can write the you know, speed of light as 300 meter per microsecond if you're okay with writing time in terms of microseconds. And also in terms of seeing an event and event happening are you know, two different things. All right, so now here we have Ann and Bill are still standing 1200 meter apart. A firecracker has exploded 300 meter on either side of Bill. That means there's a 900 meter and 1500 meter from Ann. Okay. Um, Ann sees the two flashes at the same time. According to Ann, were the explosion, were the explosions simultaneous? So, which means now what we're dealing with is if we go back here in this diagram, okay, turn it up. Imagine now there are uh, two explosions. Okay. So one is there, the other one right here. So 900 and uh, 1500. Okay. So one thing we have here is Let's say, let me kind of remove this. So we, we know that those two fire, you know, those two positions, right? 900 and 1500 is exactly same, you know, uh, 300 meters from Bill. Okay. But we're, what we're told here in the example here, in the next example, right? Is that um, according to Ann, so were the explosions simultaneous, okay? But what, what happens is that we know that she sees that flu flashes exactly at the same time. Okay. So she sees it exactly at the same time, which means um, if she sees it at the same time, does it mean it's simultaneous? Well, let's see what we have. In terms of then for her to see them at the same time, remember light has to travel. So this light travels this distance of 900 meters the other one then travels distance of 1500 meters. Okay. So think like this. That means let's call this event one and this is event two. The light from event one has to travel 900 meters. Light from event two has to travel 1500 meters. Okay. So think like this. If they happened exactly the same time, would she see them exactly the same time? Okay. Remember, seeing and happening, right? For the, the you know the event explosion, right? 
there are two different things. But still, if she sees them exactly at the same time, you have to understand that you have to take into account the fact that event light from event two has to travel, you know, extra distance, right? Extra distance to get to N. Okay. So for N to see two explosions at the same time, the one that is further, you know, further away, right, 1500, must occur earlier because it has to travel this distance first. And then when the second, you know, does this first one happen, right? Then travel exactly same time as this one over there so that she sees them both exactly at the same time. Okay. That means we have to understand that this is that extra time that needed for the event two to reach event one. And when it reaches event one, then event one happens, then they both basically, you know, Again, I'm, I'm just calling this event one, event two, but doesn't mean that there, you know, event two happened after event one. So we have to understand that. So maybe it was a poor choice, but um, the idea here is you have to, you know, in order for the for the event one and event two light reach and exactly the same time, event two, right? Firecracker at 1500 meters had to happen earlier. Okay, and it had to travel one 300 meter distance plus another 300 meter distance in order to get to the firecracker one, then they travel together exactly the same time. Which means we know that every 300 meters light covers in one microsecond. That means it had to happen two microseconds before. So that takes two microseconds for it to reach event one, firecracker one, and then they both travel together. That means what we have here is they did not happen exactly the same time. Okay. So firecracker two here happened two seconds earlier. Now for the for, for, for the other guy, for Bill, what we have is it has exactly the same distance between both each firecrackers. Okay. That means one thing we have here is that Anne and Bill, they are not moving relative to one another, okay? That means this is, this is, you know, this should, they, they should agree on simultaneity of the, uh, let's say, of, of the events. If they were moving relative to one another, then let's say that was different, but here they're not moving relative to one another. Now, Anne agreed that basically the firecracker didn't happen exactly at the same time because they had to travel different distances. So if she sees them exactly at the same time, they would be simultaneous only if they were exactly same distance from her, but they were not. So they're not simultaneous. For Bill, they are exactly same distance from him, but we already agreed that they're, they're not simultaneous and Bill is at rest relative to Anne. So he has to also agree that it's not simultaneous. That means what happens here is he sees, you know, because the, you know, firecracker two happened two seconds, two microseconds earlier, he will see that two microseconds before he sees the other one. Okay. That means he will conclude that they are also not simultaneous because they're all, both of them the same distance from him. So he will say that he will see the 1500 meter one first and then 900 meter one. All right. So let's look at then next in terms of the consequences of special relativity. So for this one, we're gonna be then looking at in terms of how the light, uh, in order to make sure that the speed of light is constant for all the observers, we have to understand then there is no absolute motion, no absolute time. Okay. To do that, we have a simple experiment. So let's say you have a reference frame as prime, okay, uh, that is moving with some velocity v. You can see, right? We're moving with some velocity v. And we have an observer in the reference frame as prime. And uh, she does an experiment. An experiment is pretty straightforward. So you have a light, um, basically a flashlight, will go up, hit the mirror, and come back down. And let's say there's a sensor over there that detects the light. Okay, that means the distance D between the sensor and 
let's say uh, the mirror is uh, lowercase d. So the total distance will be the light going up, hitting the mirror, coming back down. Okay. That means what we have here is that the flashlight, right? Flashlight emits a pulse of light directed at the mirror. That's event one. And then the pulse arrives back at the, you know, after being reflected and let's say uh, registered by the sensor. And that's, let's say, then event two. Okay. So it's a relatively straightforward. And if you talking about this person, uh, let me look P prime, right? Person prime, right? That's basically because she is in the prime reference frame. Okay. She's in the reference frame as prime and she's where the experiment is done. So what she will measure here is distance, you know, to be going back and forth is 2D. And then since the light is moving at the speed of light C, then the time of the event one and two together will be 2D divided by C, which is remember, so it's a distance divided by time that's for speed. So then rearrange distance over speed is a time. That means this will be the time measured in reference frame S prime, but uh, by uh, actually let me be like O prime, which is observer prime. Let's let's call it observer prime. So observer O prime measures delta t, and we're gonna call this p for the proper p is gonna you're gonna see it's gonna be for the proper time. Okay. So now it's a proper time because it's it's being measured by the person who's in the same reference frame as the experiment itself, okay? That means O prime is measuring pro proper time because she's in the same reference frame where the experiment is done. So that means 2D divided by C will give us the time, All right? Next, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at then what happens if the same experiment is absorbed by someone else, okay? By someone else is let's say someone who's not in the moving reference frame. So here's that, let's say reference frame S with Y and X. And let's say this person here is X prime, Y prime, and this is S prime reference frame. And reference frame S prime is moving with velocity V. All right, so then what he will observe, right? Observer O will be because the experiment, you know, because the experiment done in a moving reference frame, the light is sort of going straight up and straight down. Remember that very first experiment that we looked at when object is, you know, in a moving track, throw, you, if you throw an object upward, it's gonna go straight up and straight down in the reference, in the moving reference frame, but the observer will see a projectile. Same thing happens here. For the stationary observer in a reference frame, reference frame S, the experiment will be basically, the light goes like this, instead of straight, right? It will basically, uh, move like that, hit the mirror, and then come back down like that. Okay. That means you have completely different, um, you know, geometry of the, uh, of the, the trajectory, right, for the, for the light. Okay. Now, let's remember that delta T prime was just the distance, which happened to be, uh, let's say, 2D, divided by speed, which is C. Now, one thing they both will agree is that the light is moving at the speed of C. That one thing they agree, but nothing else they agree on. The distance, the time, those two things then has to be modified. They, they, they cannot be the same anymore, right? Otherwise the C will not be the same. So that means one thing we end up with is this. For the distance, this is the distance that traveled by light. That means we need to find how long it took for the light to travel that distance, okay? While the reference frame S prime, right, by the train was moving to the right. Well, if we do that, then geometry tells us that this length is basically C times delta T over two. That means this one is also C times delta T over two. And then this side of the triangle then is V times delta t over two. Okay, basically break it down into just two parts, right? One going up, one coming down. So we have basically it's using the triangle because this has to be the distance t, right? This is this just straight up distance from where the sensor is or the flashlight is and where the mirror is. 
That means then what we have here is you can then relate this using the Pythagorean theorem, where then equation tells you that C times delta T over two squared plus, or you know, it's equals to, which is the hypotenuse, right? So then this is equals to D times delta T over two squared plus D squared. That means if I look at this, right, that's how those are related. Okay. Well, if we rearrange this, uh, basically we just plug it out and do the calculation. One thing we will see for delta T, the time, time interval, this will be then 2D divided by square root of C square minus V square. Okay. So then what we'll do is that we'll take the C square and factor out. So because I can write this 2D divided by C, you know, C square, one minus V square over C square. So I can just basically factor out C. Then I can remove that from the uh, square root. So it becomes 2D over C, over C, then square root of one minus V square over C square. Now from here though, we can see that if I kind of, separate this, this is just 2D over C. Well, 2D over C is same as that delta TP, which was 2D over C. That means that part of that you know, equation can be basically represented with the proper time. That means delta T then is equals to 2D over C represented as the delta TP, but then you have then the factor of one minus V square over, over C square. And you can see that what you have here is there's a disagreement in terms of the time. That means what you have here is one over square root of one minus V square over C square times Delta TP, where this, you know, one over square root of one minus V square over C square is basically the coefficient of the in front of Delta TP. It means that's basically that factor that um, gives you a different uh, uh, time for the absorbers. That means you can see, right? One of the things you have here is when V zero, let's say when the train, when, when this reference frame S prime was not moving, let's say when V is equals to zero, in this equation, if I plug in this for, for zero, then this term is zero. So then you have one over one, then delta T P equals a delta T which makes sense, right? If you have a, a reference frame S prime, right? The train is not moving. Then if you do an experiment straight up or down, observer will also see straight up or down because there's no motion relative to one another. But if the train is moving, right? If the, you know, the experiment is done in a moving reference frame, then any not moving reference frame will then see a different time interval, okay? So this factor one over square root of one minus V square over C square this is basically can be defined as gamma. Okay. Where gamma is pretty much uh, this relativistic factor that we have, then I can say then delta T measurement by, done by the absorber O of this event one and two combined will be equal to then gamma times delta T P times the proper time. And one of the things you can see here is for example, if, if I have the velocity, remember, so it's, it's much more useful when you have a relativistic speed. So let's say this V here is equals to point, uh, point 0.6 C. Let's say that, you know, the train right where the experiment was done was moving at point, point 0.6 C. If I plug in then for gamma, uh, what I can see here is this is equals to one over square root of one minus point 0.6 C squared divided by C squared so then the C, C is gonna can C from top and bottom gonna cancel out. So you just basically have um, one, uh, one over square root of one minus 0. 0.6 C square, a uh, 0.6 square. So this will give us, one point two five. 
it has no units. Basically, it's a, the gamma is a unitless quantity, but we get 1.25. That means this is equals to 1.25 times delta Tp. That means whatever measurement for time that we have for the observer O prime, that means, you know, the, let's say, whatever measurement was done by this person here, right? Observer O prime, then observer O can measure 1.25 times that time. That means, for example, let's say proper time was, I don't know, 10 seconds. Then this will be 1.25 times 10 seconds or 12.5 seconds. That means there's already a disagreement on time measurements, okay? So this is known as time dilation, okay? And if there's a object moving, you know, basically relative to some observer, they will never agree on time measurements. Okay, so you can see, right? So you have two, two delta Ts. Delta T, this is basically by some kind of observer that measures an event in a different reference frame. Delta TP is the time of the event in the same reference frame when it's done, when the experiment is conducted. That's why it's called a proper time, okay? It's called the proper time and it's always gonna be the experimental measurement of the event in the same reference frame when, you know, where the event, where the event is occurring. And that's why then measurement of that event from any other reference frames will be in disagreement with that. And it will always be more. That means measurement done by other reference frames will always be greater than the measurement done in the reference frame of the experiment. So this is known as a time dilation, okay? So time dilation basically um, is a consequence of special theory of relativity. That means if you have an experiment where the, let's say, for example, so here's Earth and here's a person on Earth. So we're gonna have call this observer O. And then here's a spaceship. And I don't know, my spaceship looks like an airplane, I guess. So let's say then, let's say this spaceship is moving at the speed of 0.9 C, 0.9 C, let's say. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna look at in terms of uh, observer O prime, measuring uh, basically the one second interval on his, on his, uh, on his watch. So delta T P because this is the you know astronaut measuring the one second time interval on his watch, one second is then the proper time. Okay, that means basically for him when the time passes one second time passes right for him is one second. That means let's say one of those analog clocks right uh, the the second you know um, call it like a hand and so it's a second hand right so hand that you know, represents seconds. Um, so let's say it's one second for the astronaut. Then what will be for exactly same thing measured by the observer on Earth? Well, we use this equation. So we first find gamma, square root of one minus, so one over, so one over square root of one minus, then speed at which the reference frame S prime is moving so 0.9 C over C squared, you can see that C cancels out. So then the gamma is equal to one over one minus 0.9 square. And if I make this calculation, I get two point, roughly 2.3 seconds or 2.3, sorry. And then Delta T is equals to gamma times delta T proper, which is 2.3 times one second interval. So 2.3 seconds. That means it will, it will take 2.3 seconds for that second arm to move one second. Okay. That means, you know, go, go one time, you know, move one time, which means every time it moves, it's one second. Now, which means there's a disagreement, disagreement in terms of that. Now, what it, what it means here is uh, sometimes very confusing, right? So what do you mean like, let's say 2.3 seconds? Well, think like this. 
So the measurement done by the astronaut of the second hand, right, on his clock, on his watch, is basically going to be exactly the same regardless of where he's doing this experiment. That means, you know, if he if he was, you know, on Earth in his house, look at the, you know, uh, how long it will take for this, you know, uh, for that arm to, for the hand to move uh, one second, it's exactly the same. For him, it's just one second. But because he is moving relative to some observer, this observer will see the same event, which is the second arm, second hand moving one second, he will see that happening at the lower rate. Instead of one second, it takes it, it takes 2.3 seconds for that to happen. Okay. So that's what we have, you know, a time dilation. So that's why, for example, if the astronaut goes to another star system and comes back, and for him, it's, let's say, 14 years, 15 years, but this is 15, 14 with respect to his reference frame. And his reference frame, the time, right, will be different measured by the observer on Earth. Because as we agreed, right, the time seems to be moving slower for the observer O. That means 14 years, depending on how fast it's going here, right, will be completely different. Okay, we can't even, we can't even calculate, right? We can't even calculate that in terms of what will be the, the time, right? So again, that will be based on the uh, on the speed, which is let's say 0.9c gives you a factor of 2.3. So if it's 14 years, then for someone on earth, it will be 2.3 times 14 years, all right? So roughly let's say 30, 30 years, right? So instead of 14 years on earth, it will be 30 years. And it actually physically will be 30 years on earth. That means for the astronaut, it takes 14 years to go and come back. But for someone on earth, it took an astronaut 30 years to go and come back okay. because astronaut was moving faster relative to the observer on earth. The time of that event, which is going to the another star planet and coming back will be in disagreement. That's why, you know, that's how this, let's say, you know, we developed this, right? So measurement of the light going to the, hitting the mirror coming back was a disagreement for the two observers. Same thing will happen there. How long it will take for the astronaut to go and come back will be different for the uh, two different you know, observers, astronaut and uh, let's say, and the person on, on Earth. Okay, so that's kind of what we have. So the time dilation is not absorbed in our everyday lives. Okay, so at slow, at slow speeds, right? This gamma is, is so small that no time dilation occurs. <laughs> but, you know, they still did some experiments where they, you know, um, looked at, they took two atomic clocks they uh, made sure that they show exactly, exactly same time. You know, uh, atomic clocks is the most accurate clocks that we have. And they took another one, uh, put it in the fastest, you know, airplane that we have. And this airplane went around earth, let's say, you know, as fast as it can several times and then came back. So that means one, ex one clock stayed in the laboratory. The other one was in the airplane moving around very fast around earth. But then when they brought and they compared, the times disagreed. That means the one that was, let's say, on, uh, on an airplane was running slower. Because for, you know, if you're moving fast, your time is different relative to another clock that was not moving relative to you. Again, if you're an astronaut, for you, time is not going faster. It's exactly the same as, you know, you would be, let's say, if you were not moving at all but relative to someone else who's not, or who's moving slower relative to you, for them, your, you know, your time is basically, basically moving slower. Because for them, you know, let's say if you go 14 years and come back, for them that, that, that was 30 years rather than 14 years. Anyways, Delta TP is called the proper time interval. And the proper time interval is a time interval between events as measured by an observer who sees the events occur at the same point in space, okay? That means, you know, basically the same reference frame where the experiment is. And one of the difficulties about this type of, you know, problem is to identify who is the measuring, who is the observer that measures the proper time. So that's why I try to always understand what's happening, where is the event, which is the reference frame, which information is given, so then you can make a correct calculation. All right, so... Um, 
again, so this is again this is such a concept that is very difficult, you know, intuitive. Like it's it's a very uh, abstract idea. That's why like you, you will see like different you know ways of explaining this. So if a clock is moving with respect to you, the time interval between the ticks of the moving clock is observed to be longer than the time interval between ticks of an individual clock in your reference frame. Okay. So all physical processes are measured to slow down when these processes occur in the frame moving with respect to the observer. Okay. With anybody moving faster you know, relative to you, for them, the time will be, seems like it's moving slower, but only slow relative to you. For them, everything is, you know, is fine. And this process is not science fiction, right? It's actually science fact. This process can be chemical and biological as well. That means, you know, they age slower than you. Anybody that is moving faster than you, they age slower than you, right? That's why we have this, um, so like, let's say a different, uh, Paradoxes, right? So twin paradox and things like that, which we'll see. But, and, but this is something that has been experimentally be verified. So for example, one of the experimental verification is um, we have uh, what we call um, subatomic, some subatomic, you know, exotic subatomic particles called muons. Okay. So there's a, the, the muons are unstable particles that have the same charge as an electron, but a mass 207 times more than the electron. So we always study about um, electrons and protons and muons, but there are actually other particles that are sort of like their own, they have their own family. So our family of the particles is the one that we, you know, we are composed of our electron, protons and neutrons or quarks, if you want to go deeper than that, but there are also other ones. So let's say there's a, another particle, charged particle that is just negative, just like the electron, but you know, it is, uh, you know, much heavier than that. So we are called, we call them muons. Now, these muons are unstable means that they don't have a, a long life. So when they, uh, you know, sometimes they can generate it and then they can um, decay into smaller, you know, uh, particles, let's say become electrons and so on and so forth. So you can say, they are produced high in the atmosphere. Okay. Now, one of the things we have here is that, so here's an experiment. So there are two things. There's this basically that, you know, uh, prediction and there's an experimental result. Okay, so according to let's say prediction, what we have is this. So this is when muon created. Okay, so this is uh, not, you know, this is using the classical, uh, let's say prediction. If I take the classical prediction, muons basically have a half-life of 2.2 microseconds, for example, right? So then delta T proper is equal to 2.2 microseconds. When we measure this reference in, in the reference frame at the rest with respect to them, that means you have someone right here measures this, and this is 2.2 microseconds. Okay, now they can then what we have here is because this is the you know proper time, which this, this, this is their you know half life according you know to the how long it will take them to move down before decaying. If they, you know, let's say moving at some speed, which is approximately speed of light C, then non-relativistic or classical prediction would be they can only move about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the two meters, which is roughly 600 meters, right, before decaying. Okay, that means they're at the you know higher altitude in the atmosphere, going down about 600 meters, they should decay and just be gone, right? So like, let's say into, into smaller, smaller particles, lighter particles. So according to the classical theory, you, if you, if you put a detector right here, you will not be detecting any muons because they will be long gone. Okay. Well, that's not what happens. What happens here is that this detector that you have actually detects a lot of muons. That means Let's say that detector is roughly, let's say 5,000 meters below where they, you know, create it. But according to the classical theory, about 600 meters, 700 meters, you know, uh, below the point of creation, they should be decaying, but they don't. They actually go down all the way to the detector and we can detect most of them. Because how can that happen? How, you know, how can they, you know, have this life, you know, let's say the, 
uh, half life and uh, you know we can then calculate how long they can you know move with that you know let's say moving at the speed you know how can then uh, basically reach all the way to the you know to the surface of earth that was basically you know a mystery right so you, you can't really uh, use the classical physics to try, try to you know describe that well what we have here is then we have to understand right then there has to be like let's say this relativistic consideration so the muon's lifetime is well is measured relative to the observer on earth okay so then what we have here is if you then talk about from the muon let's say uh reference frame you get then different values since delta t is equals to gamma down, down 10 times delta p so that means you know what we have here is well delta t then um, will be different right so that means what we're doing you were we, we were thinking about you know the time this 2.2 microseconds which were which were, which is basically the time relative to the muon that means you know when the muon created and muon destroyed is 2.2 microseconds but you can only do that if you are in the reference frame of the muon but we're not we're in the reference frame of earth and with respect to reference from earth we should be then taking not the same time uh, as the you know from the reference frame of the muon but time for the reference frame of earth that means we should then take say that this is gamma times delta p okay so gamma times delta p then gives us different you know much greater time so if we then get a much greater time that means then the particle has more time to travel longer distances okay that means 2.2 microseconds sorry 2.2 microsecond is the time measured if you were like let's say moving with the muon but obviously we're not moving with the muon we, we're stationary on earth so relative to us muon is moving and if you if you plug in this and use the let's say whatever i don't know, let's say muon is moving uh maybe let's say a 0.99 c or something like that right so then if you plug in this then you get time that is much higher than the proper time of the muon which means now they have a lot more time to go down and that's what happens okay because one of the things we you have to also also understand is that there's another um relativistic consequence is for us this distance is about 5000 meters but for a muon that is moving fast that distance actually shrinks so in their 2.2 microsecond they go they, they seem to be moving shorter distance but not because it is a short this is just because they are moving fast for them the distance shrinks we're going to talk about that it's known as a length contraction okay so that's another consequence of relativity okay so the last thing we have here is sort of like that astronaut that i was talking about so it's another consequence of relativity where if you talk about two twins i mean basically um a set of twins right so two uh one is speedo one go slow um so uh we have a speedo that travels to planet x 20 light years from the earth and light years is a distance the distance it takes for the light to travel in one year okay so that means you can technically you know uh, measure that distance in meters if you want to so let's say then the speedo basically is in a ship that travels at the 0.95 c so for him he goes 20 light years now after reaching planet x he immediately returns to earth at the same speed when speed speedo returns he has aged 13 years but go slow aged 40 go slow go slow aged 42 years and if you notice that you know interesting thing about those names right so he aged 42 42 years again why because of the uh relativistic effect right so because uh speedo was moving at the high speed relative to go slow he was experiencing much slower right rate of aging right so there you know he only aged 13 years because relative to go slow his time was moving slower okay so that means it, it took 42 years for him to, you know, basically go uh, 13 years. 
in terms of the time disagreement. Okay, so this is again another consequence of um, relativity. That means if you are if you're moving fast, for you time is moving seems to be moving slower relative to a slower moving uh, absorbers. Okay, because we take let's say Earth to be not moving at all, uh, like let's say the Gauss law is not moving at all, then you get sort of like the maximum effect. Okay, so they're twins, same age, but then they come back. One is age 13 years, the other one, or 14 years, the other one is uh, 42 years. Okay, so that's another consequence of that. All right. <clears throat>